And so a lot of musicians come, you know, we are all formed by assumptions that grow from our experiences. And so, for example, uh, a lot of musicians, if you ask them, well, do you want to be successful? Yeah, I'd love to be successful. Uh, and then you say, well, what do you want to do with your life? And they might say the most obvious choices. I like to play in an orchestra or I like to teach in college, which of course might be a great thing to do for a certain kind of person. The truth is not everybody who wants to get those gigs can get them. We have done such an amazing job of cultivating these outstanding artists. There's simply an oversupply and an under demand for that kind of work. But the good news, and I, I think this is a great time to be an artist, but for leaders and people who can create opportunities and think differently, in some ways conditions have never been more favorable to artists. But in order to tap into those things, you have to change. You might have to change what you do. You might have to change your art, or you might have to change the way that you approach your art, or you might have to change the way that you think about your role in the society. An entrepreneurial mindset means a lot of different things in a lot of different contexts. It, it, it's, about, it's about having a sense of marketing uh, prowess and, and developing a clear brand and being able to cultivate a following. But so much of an entrepreneurial mindset, uh, the way that I see it, is, is finding solutions where others do not. You know, this is kind of a personal philosophy for me that if a thousand people view a particular problem, and 999 of them arrive at similar conclusions. I aspire to be the one who sees things differently and who finds opportunity where others see only roadblocks or who finds the future where others can't look away from the past. So the first thing is just to understand and, and be comfortable with the, the, the notion that the first idea that you have, the most obvious idea, is rarely the best one, right? The most obvious career option for you, sometimes it's the best one, but it rarely is. Often it's not until you get to the fourth or the fifth uh, idea. When you come up with an entrepreneurial idea, the first idea might not be the best one. It usually takes, otherwise everyone else would be doing it, right? So it takes several steps. Second thing, when something is very close to our heart, we often become, or when something challenges the way we think, we often tense up and become kind of reactionary. So, uh, whereas, you know, if you say to me, uh, you know, police officers, all they care about is donuts. <laughs> I'm not a police officer. No one in my family is a police officer. So, uh, wow, that's very interesting. And we can have a very rational conversation over whether or not it is true that the main motivator for police officers is donuts. But if you say something like, you know, composers, since I'm a composer, pianists are too serious, or pianists do this, or whatever. Well, that's something that is really close to my heart because I identify with that. And the initial reaction for many people is to tense up and push that away. And a suggestion that I have is, if you notice yourself being reactionary to something, investigate that assumption because it might have a lot of meaning for you. And the third thing uh, is, a, is, a, is a technique that I like to use a lot of the time called amplification. So it's this idea that if you have a dream or an idea of where you want to go, what happens over so much of the time is that people have their dream and then as they get older, their dream gets smaller and smaller and smaller. I asked a group of freshmen, uh, what are your dreams? said their dreams and some had big dreams, some had small dreams, but they all had dreams. Then I said, if I were to ask you the same question again in three years when you're a senior, do you think your dreams would be bigger or smaller than they are today? And they unanimously shouted out smaller. I said, well, if I had asked you your dreams when you were in the fourth grade, do you think you would have had bigger or smaller dreams? And they all said bigger. Why is it that for most people as we get older, we dream smaller, right? Well, it's because we have to get practical, we have to get real. And so, you know, we wanna change the world when we're young, but as we get older, I'll just take any job. I just, you know, give me minimum wage and I'll be happy to do this one, one kind of thing. 
And so one of the things that I've tried to do and that I try to instill in students is how do you take a dream and instead of compromising that, how do you make it bigger? You know, a lot of uh, individuals become psychologists in order to work out some kind of challenge they have in their own life. It was kind of like that for me. I, I got involved in entrepreneurship, not because I knew all of the answers, but because I didn't. I went through school, I thought I did all of the right things, I won all these awards, I went to the best schools, I got great grades, did all of these things. And I remember it, it was a, a month before graduation and I, I, I went to my, my teacher, my guru, my hero. I said, I, I, I have one, one more question for you and then I'll leave you alone. What should I do with my life? And you know, this is a man, I, we would spend hours on end pouring over musical problems. But for the first time, I saw this thing I never experienced before, a blank stare. And the career advice I got was, David, I don't know what to tell you. I'm sure you'll be fine. And that was my career training. So, you know, I, I felt at that moment bet betrayed and I felt as if my life had been a lie as if the music that I had pursued, classical music and jazz music, was dead and there was no room for me on this planet. There was no relevance for me. So that was a very, entered really a pivotal and very difficult phase. But when I came out of that, I became determined that I was going to solve my life. And as I started to explore solutions and look around, I realized that my friends and my teachers and colleagues and heroes and, and students were all facing similar kinds of circumstances, and that this was kind of a challenge that was facing our whole industry. So this was at a time where, while there were a number of books, for example, that had come out about the music industry, uh, most had nothing or very, very little to offer someone with my profile. I remember there was this one book, uh, and it was talking about various career paths, and one, one ch chapter it actually had, or it had a page or two on how do you have a career as a classical composer? Which was one of the things I was pursuing. I'm like, this is great. Here I'm gonna figure out my solutions. And this, the answer, according to this book, is you, you don't, most classical composers turn to lawn care. <laughs> uh, and so that was a really hard moment, but also an eye-opening one, and I became determined to solve my life. There's a great book by Richard Florida called uh, The Creative Class. And what he argues in this is that, you know, it, businesses are looking to make money. So it would make sense then that businesses would all move to Mississippi or they'd all move to Kansas or wherever is the cheapest place to live. Yet we haven't seen that happen. Because the best employees don't just want a job and they won't go anywhere. They want to be in livable places. So if you want to attract the best talent, you have to be in a livable place. And uh, the arts play a huge difference in the quality of living that we provide for residents. So uh, in a city like Columbia, that is definitely on its way up, one of the challenges and the opportunities is figuring out how do we become an arts city? And that helps to bring businesses to town, that helps to bring and cultivate tourism, that helps for the quality of life and the excitement of people who are already our residents.